Hey, great. Hi, I'm an architect and an urban designer here in Brooklyn, New York. I run a nonprofit 501c3 uh, called Terraform One. And we uh, uh, think about the, well, I guess we're a design science collaborative, and we think about the future of the city, which includes really everything. Everything from the smallest components to the largest components. Or our tagline is the doorknob to the democracy. And this is actually nothing new. Uh, part of my dissertation work at MIT was to think about uh, cities holistically, think about all sorts of connections, and it's been done before. So this drawing shows something like here, well, I guess one artist's view in King's Dream of New York, the entire city designed holistically. So it connects dirigibles to skyscraper uh, ports where there are docks on the terminus of buildings. It has clusters of skyscrapers with links or bridges that go into the circulatory cores. Thinks about canyonated systems of mobility separating passengers, uh, or I should say, a slow moving traffic from fast moving traffic, pedestrians on arcaded walkways, etc. And this is kind of uh, uh, something that had fascinated me. So eventually it became a, a new field, or that was the proposition. A new field where an architect designs a car, an ecologist designs a building, and car designers think about about or design an ecology. So I, I think this is our, our, our kind of approach. And I know that it's an incredibly new field because, well, you know, I'm probably the only one in it. <laughs> uh, this was us on the cover of Popular Science. This was a big moment for us because I, I love Popular Science. It's been lying to me since I was a kid. And this was the notion of <laughs> the future of the green city. And, and being a part of that imagination actually is what's crucial. It's what the mission of Popular Science does. And they certainly get it right every so often. So we were thinking about a whole host of things that make up ecology, mobility, and the city. Here, blimps, jetpacks, uh, incredibly uh, well-designed bioclimatic skyscrapers, all fitting into this, this singular narrative. You know, talk about each one of them. And behind it is, is just a, a, a series of uh, research projects that builds up ideas about mobility. And I know you can't see that chart, so I'll kind of zoom in to show what the history of mobility moves from in a specific context, let's say New York, going from uh, horses and carriages all the way up to propositions about the future where we have smart vehicles, where we have soft cars, where we have cars that are stacked or go vertically up the sides of buildings, et cetera. And we've been working on all of these. So at MIT, uh, with Bill Mitchell at the Smart Cities Group, we were looking at the future car. And we decided that we didn't want to design just one car because, well, what's the point? People would forget about it after you know, five years or so. Uh, we thought we can design technologies or a lexicon of ideas that would fit into every vehicle everywhere, like the airbag. So here is the car as a wheel. The entire vehicle is the wheel. Drivetrain, suspension, motoring, and a modicum of intelligence inside this wheel. You add three or four wheels together, and you get that car. And it, you can uh, kind of articulate the wheels so they can uh, uh, spin on a dime or perform omnidirectionally. So you know, this car is not doing uh, jumping jacks, but it's actually uh, it can parallel park in this kind of fashion, re-engaging the city uh, in a way that we haven't done before. In fact, uh, the argument would be that every 20th century city has been designed around the car. Finally, we want to design systems of mobility that fit that specific context, a car designed for the city. We still include regional transportation because it's good, it's fabulous, subways and trains are great, but it's an extra five kilometers to places that you can't get to from the subway way out there in Queens, for instance, you know, parts of Brooklyn, that we connect our, our mobility systems to. So you can imagine these flows of traffic happening. Here is another version that we did, the Smart Cities Group. This is called the Bit Car. It is an articulating frame with lithium ion batteries inside. It's an electric car. It is a shared ownership model. So you don't own it, but it connects to the existing subway systems. The frame of this vehicle stands up, right, reducing its footprint by about 30%. It's kind of a Facebook on wheels, so it knows where your friends are and it can get you there. They interlock like shopping carts. You could stack about 350 of them on a New York City block as opposed to 35 SUVs. And this, whoop. You can always take the car in the middle, which uh, everyone always wants. And if the whole vehicle's inside the wheel, uh, uh, you, you could freeze up the body or the skin to be anything you'd want. So here we thought about those tectonic relationships with e-ink, and a car would send off words or a semiotic pulse wherever you are in the city. So you could be in Boston and say, you know, I love the Yankees, make a lot of friends. Or the, the, the entire vehicle can be opaque, tracking wherever the driver looks, it creates a point of aperture. Or the car could be pretty much clear, naked, and you'd have a visor track the sun. Uh, we thought of them moving in flocks and herds of super soft-like cars, networked and linked. You pick up your cell phone, you summon it, you drive where you need to go, and then it parks itself. 
and how you'd phase this into the city, because there's always some curmudgeon that's thinking like, oh, well, you know, you can't do this instantly. Yes, we know. Uh, we were thinking red cars would be the hard, precious, precious, shiny metal boxes that say, don't touch me, don't look at me, or every vehicle today. Then introducing our soft, intelligent cars that are networked and linked. And they would move into the city, and they would find something like a Hummer, and they'd cluster around it, and move it off the side of the road, <laughs> and they'd take it over. They go into the vertical Z or to the Z axis, separating passenger from freight systems, uh, uh, creating these kind of garage like systems on the sides of tall building clusters, connecting circulatory cores to mobility systems. And thinking of, about another first principle in design, which we thought was uh, phenomenal. In this case, it was a car that would be edible, a car that you can eat. We wanted to have super green vehicles. So uh, much to our chagrin, Henry Ford had already created such a vehicle. It's made out of soy based plastics. Uh, here he is hitting it with an axe. The axe bounces off of the surface of that car. It does not leave uh, scratch because the coloration is impregnated in the material. He wanted to merge America's great agricultural economy with its great automobile economy. But back then they never heard of the energy crisis and we, well I guess he kind of dumped the idea. Uh, and we thought we wanted to revive it and make these kind of soft cars out of all sorts of starch foams or air bladders or air quilts and make a car that was as soft as possible and intelligent. And we came up with this design, which you'd be fired for if you work for our sponsors, which was General Motors. And this is a car that, uh, or I think Colbert said it best, you're fired anyway if you're working for General Motors. But it, it, <laughs> this is a car where we decided that as a team, we would refuse to allow anyone to design, in a, uh, anyone to die in a car accident again. It would be impossible to die in this vehicle. Because it's designed for downtown cores, for cities, it doesn't need to go faster than 30 miles an hour. If you're in a cab going 30 miles an hour, it already feels fast. You're going to get to where you need to go. Uh, and every component in the car is pneumatic and soft, incredibly lightweight. It deals with the life cycle analysis of moving these vehicles around. And it's OK to scuff up or rub up against other cars. In fact, that's the point of the design. You want to bump and move and say hello to your neighbor and look them in the eye. So we have this, what we call hug and kiss soft car. And this was what, you know, something that if it hit your sister, it would tickle her, not kill her. <laughs> and that we rethought the brakes in these kinds of vehicles. So where the wheels touch the ground, creating friction, what we call the contact patch, we'd have the entire belly of the car collapse, increasing, increasing that friction by 10,000 fold. They can go flaccid because they're mostly pneumatic. You would stack them like a kind of a car cake. An attendant would pull it out, blow it up, and you would use that vehicle. Uh, Reebok got very interested in what General Motors was doing, so they became our next kind of sponsor, uh, and, uh, especially if everything needs to be soft. So we introduced the shoe car, which is pretty <laughs> funky. It really puts the funk in functionalism, because you got a zipper to get in and out of that vehicle. Uh, and then thank you, Europe. Here is the smart car by Mercedes. Uh, our vehicles, the exact same footprint as that smart car, but remember these two wheels uh, move together as the vehicle stands up, so we're 25 plus percent smaller than a, a smart car. You get off onto the curb, uh, you park perpendicular to the vehicle. The seat is designed for ergonomics. If there's anything inelegant you can ever do, it's get in and out of a car, especially if you're really tall or you're old. So we have a, a lip or a little stair that you can climb into a seat that is at a regular height. It opens up with all the kind of room for ingress and egress that you'd ever need. That canopy kind of protects you from the elements. And you'd stack these up on the street and take them when you need to. And this is where it is no longer about cars. Actually, when we started thinking about, these are very large lithium ion batteries on wheels. And in fact, if you think about it, they're actually a new type of electric grid. So they can absorb peak demands or redistribute loads on the fly. Con Edison is one of our sponsors uh, at, at Terraform, uh, certainly interested in this. In fact, if I had a choice for America, I think I would just reduce America's uh, or the Detroit three companies to doing nothing but carriage design. And we should have America's five great electric companies thinking about fitting out our infrastructure and our, and our mobility systems integrated together for our cities, because they're certainly ready to do it. Now, everything is kind of great. We've been asking all these good questions, moving around these soft like cars. But if you've ever seen the movie WALL-E, you know, sort of the end there, if everyone has, is constantly mediated by technology, we look like giant infants and we you know, have no uh, muscle mass, we're doomed. So uh, we were thinking of other forms of ecological health. In this case, it's what we call the human-powered river gym. It is powered by the human buttocks. It affects your thighs on a commute. You go from locker room to locker room in one of these river gyms. It's kind of the point. So thinking about health and mobility was important. And then air-based systems. 
here, and because Thanksgiving is coming up and my little daughter is going to see it for the first time, I too had this, this kind of fantasy of having the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade happening every day, but not just in Manhattan. We could certainly have it in Brooklyn. And think about a mobility system where we have these kind of soft like tentacles hanging down with ski lift chairs that would move us from five to 50 blocks wherever we go. And it doesn't need to go fast. It would be kind of on the fly transport, hop on, hop off. And you can transverse various borders that you couldn't do before. Because in that Thanksgiving Day Parade, all of this energy that, you know, that's taken to keep Homer Simpson or Spider-Man up takes about 50 people to hold it down. We want to harness that and use that for a mobility system and control it with a funicular. And then this shows this kind of theory of all this becomes smart mobs uh, and, and uh, smart dots and soft mobs. And it's this theory of a city where all these devices are interconnected, privileging and this is important, the best way to explore urban space, which is the alpha position of the foot, and certainly the bicycle as well. So we want these spaces to be dominant, but we're also thinking that we need to meet certain demands about delivery of freight and passengers that may not want to travel in that particular fashion. So here we are having a street that is also intelligent. It does something that you probably, well, uh, well it answers this question. What is the calculus? What is the textbook? What is the method you refer to any place on the planet Earth when it comes to parking? What is that, what is that system? Uh, um, you know, the, the answer is hope. Yeah. And we want to change that. Have a modicum of intelligence in the street. Tell, them, tell you, I'm here. I'm a meter. You can park here because no one else is. It's for free. If there's a lot of demand, maybe you pay a quarter. But have this kind of connectivity so you go from A to B and cut down what we call circuity. If 60% of the energy in the United States goes to transportation, 35 to 40% of that is doing stupid things. An 18-wheeler in Texas going down the wrong road for, or highway for 15 minutes and then going back for another 15 minutes, all that energy is wasted. We need to get just slightly more intelligent. And we certainly can do it with things like 5 cent RFID tags, et cetera. Another project we worked on came from a, a snarky comment from someone uh, that was a friend of ours, which was this notion of the, uh, the jet pack. And this, this is a kind of a kid, a friend of uh, one, one of my other friends from school. And we were all, all these urbanists were hanging out together in a bar. And he said, you know what? You guys are doomed. Because everything you know about cities will change when some guy invents the jetpack. And we thought, oh, you know, it's not going to happen. The New York Times three years ago on the cover said the jetpack's here. You can buy one for $100,000. Uh, Martin Jetpack, Jetpack International. We decide to take that seriously. Tokyo has been doing it since the 80s. They actually have skyscrapers with jetpack ports on them already. We're starting to catch up to what they're up to. We looked at designs of jetpacks based on the same principles of our cars. They're super soft. They move in flocks and herds. It's, you, know, you can get from Newark to Wall Street in, in you know, 29 seconds as opposed to 29 minutes in an SUV on a good day. You, you just land on a building. You unzip. You get out. And these are some of our designs. Uh, you know, they, they move, and there's no other way to describe it. But they, they, they move on hydrogen peroxide, and it looks kind of like this, like a you're going to float, and then another one comes along, and you, you, know, you can hit one another and say hi. It's OK. Uh, and there, there is a, a parachute in the crotch in case all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and they're tugged to go longer distances with these particular vehicles. And then oh, I never get a chance to show everything. Uh, this is a, another project called Homeway. It's our solution to what Obama was thinking about when it came to the smart grid. This is stopping sprawl, which is on th this side. And thinking about a linear urbanism connecting to our existing arteries and, and movement systems for infrastructure. If we're expecting to double the amount of housing, let's not create more suburbs. Let's think about rebranding, uh, well, I guess white trash, trailer systems, and get America, which is always on wheels, moving but connecting its housing to moving. Thinking about our new society, which is really based on systems that are overloaded and dynamic and constantly moving, things like uh, you know, eBay with its uh, commodities, commodities exchange or Foursquare or, or Facebook. These are, this is a new society, and we don't have a choice today. So we want to offer some choice, not all choice. So we move along our existing highways and connect it to waste, food, water, and infrastructure to have a 100% self-reliant, no input and output, linear urbanism. And this is nothing new. 
Uh, this was actually proposed by the Soviets in 1917. They were called the disurbanists. What they wanted to do is to keep the population, the peri-urban population around Moscow, constantly moving to avo avoid nuclear holocaust. What we want to do is, well, it's not nuclear holocaust, but rethink our, 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 our uh, economy systems, rethink the climate alongside rethinking our mobility systems and, and housing systems. So here's the suburbs moving. Uh, here is one of the giant models we love to make here in our great gallery at Pratt. This was, uh, was uh, you know, uh, moves from the linear bourbon condition uh, to, to this, the city core. You can see the geothermal, the food systems, the wind turbines here. Here's a great shot of a house party. So you can you know, hang out for a weekend, do anything you want to your neighbors, and then kind of drive away the next day. So this, this has been done before, but I want to show you what we've been up to in Brooklyn. This is a technology that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching or grafting inosculate matter or trees into specific geometries and vines. We use computation to control the growth or kind of tweak nature into very specific shapes. You can make it any shape you want. I know some of you on blogs say it's ugly, blah, blah, blah. You can shape it to anything you need to. So we just chose this one. You infill it with uh, horse hair and straw. And we've gotten this solution at full scale. We've been experimenting with all sorts of semi-epiphytic matter, growing vines or interspecies together grafted into specific geometries here at doubly curved surface, in dealing with lack of solar income, infestation from mites, capillary activity from water, and looking at creating something called the fab tree hab. This is a home that is a part of the environment. It is supposed to be a part of the landscape. That's its kind of point. I think probably the biggest problem is time from some people, but I think this is my last point. In our society, we wait 12 years for a bottle of scotch. I think we can wait you know, five to 10 years for, for homes that are 100% a part of the metabolism of the landscape. Time's up. Thank you very much. <laughs>